Welcome. So this is not the talk on Lean Startup. And I'm not Istvan, in case you haven't recognized. So my name is Jutta Eckstein, and I'm an independent coach, consultant, trainer from based in Germany. And this talk, if it's now not on Lean Startup, it is on teams, and especially on self-organizing teams, and looking at them, what happens if they are like co-located, distributed, and also if they are large. So I could imagine if you are working in Azure for a longer time, some of the things might sound familiar, and I really hope that you will find some other, um, maybe tips and tricks or thoughts even, uh, which you hadn't had before. That's my hope. Um, that's my marketing and sales slide. So we have done that and we get started. And only if I switch this on. Okay, now it's working. Very good. Um, yeah, so this is my little agenda. I first want to look into what, what do we need in order to build a self-organizing team? So of course we can just get started saying uh, we put these people together and now just self-organize yourself. And most of the time this isn't really working. So I want to look into this just in general. And I also want to look into this uh, topic that's often a big issue again, self-organization, which is multi-projecting. So uh, a few words on that. Then team maturity stages and collaboration is the, the next topic I want to look at, at, at. And then large and global settings for teams. And I, I want to do a little time check. Actually, I hope to talk to one of the officials before I know that the, this session ends when the next one is starting, which makes me always feel a little bit nervous because I think there needs to be some time for setting up and so on. So I probably have an hour from now, I assume. So that Mike has some time to set up here and get started. OK, so if nobody objects to that, that seems to be right. Good, so building self-organizing teams and uh, multi-projecting is what I want to look at first. And the thing is, the ingredients for a self-organizing team is, the main one is that the team actually is enabled to take responsibility. What I mean with this is, if we set up a team and the team depends in many ways on other teams, people, whatever, then they are not enabled to take the responsibility for something because they always have to wait for somebody else to deliver in order to really finish what they, they have to finish. So in, in a different way, this is that the task that team has to do and the competency, so everything that's needed to really work on that task, and the responsibility for that task has to lie in one hand. And this one hand is the self-organizing team. And whenever you start to cut these or separate these three things, like somebody is doing the task, but somebody else is responsible for it, and then maybe the competency is also at a different place, you will have a hard time, and probably it's not only a hard time, it will be impossible for one of those groups to really act in a self-organizing way or to um, self-organize them. So those three things have to go together. And this is what um, in, in HRV to be talk about the cross-functional teams. And I point that out, although I'm, I'm pretty sure you have heard about cross-functional teams before, but that's the reason. We have to have the cross-functional teams in order that they can or are enabled to self-organize. And with cross-functional teams, what we mean with that, we, what we mean with this is that all the roles that are required to have the competency responsibility and implement or work on that task, all the roles that are required for that have to be within that team. And the same is true for the know how or rather the skills necessary to, to do that. 
And for the roads, well, I gave you some examples there. So it could be like the main experts, developers, UI, also the ones who are deciding on what's, what's happening here. And, and for the skills know-how, it's whatever we need to do according to probably the definition of done needs to be inside that team and cannot be split and put somewhere else or be delegated to a different place. And it could mean we don't have that know-how, all the skills necessary, so this means we have to gain it. So that's, that's fine too, so we learn all that stuff. So it's more like an, an integrated perspective than a separative which enables us to take that responsibility. Um, yeah, and only then we are able to organize ourselves. In Agile, we do a lot of stuff to make that possible, to work together and to self-organize. And I'm not sure if you have seen that. I have seen it many times from people, well, companies, they hear, hear about Agile and they hear about Scrum, so they say like, okay, you're a team now and you stand, have a stand up every morning at 9 a.m. in that room over there. And what's happening is the people who are standing there at 9 a.m. every day, day after the other, they think like, this is a waste of time. So they are standing there and then the one guy, well, let's see, like, you are telling what you're working on or, or even what you achieved till the last day, till the last day and what's in your way for achieving your next thing. And to me, this is completely meaningless because I'm working on something different. And the same is true for you, right? And the, the point is just standing together doesn't make us a team. On the other hand, if we are working on the same thing, having this in mind, the competency, the responsibility and the task is in the hand of the team, then it is meaningful what we are sharing at this daily stand-up. So having a daily stand-up by itself doesn't make us agile and doesn't help us to self-organize, but on the other hand, if we have that joint goal, it does help us. And um, the other things are helping too, again, if we have that joint goal, if we are jointly estimating these tasks, if we are doing the planning together, if we are, for example, pair program, all of these things are only possible if we have the same goal. If everyone works on something else, then it's a group of people who can never manage to self-organize. And um, again, if we do that, then we gain something that's called a higher competency within that group, which also means we can help each other, we can learn from each other, and the learning can be on the business, on the technology, sometimes even like minor things, minor in quotes, like the um, dealing, um, working with specific tools. You probably have seen that as well and experienced that. You are, for example, in a meeting and somebody is um, using, for example, Excel, and there are often two things happening. The one, at one time, you kind of roll your eyes and think, oh my gosh, is there a way to work with Excel in a worse way than that person is now using that tool? So can it be any slower? And sometimes just the opposite is happening. So, oh, what kind of shortcut was that? He did that so quickly. So. How did he do that? So also like handling of tools is often a big thing too. Yeah, and with that bigger competency, we can also like, yeah, deal with absences much better. So if like a person is missing from the team, we just help together in order to fulfill that gap. So because that person is in, on holidays or, or maybe um, is uh, sick or something like that. So that's the, the, I would say, the foundation, what we had covered right now. And then there are some uh, few other things with it. And the first thing I want to talk about is the, I believe, is that true? Is the Scrum Master. And maybe you remember what I said when we had the, uh, how was that called? In the morning when we announced our topics, that the Scrum Master is not always the one helping the team to self-organize. Of course, the, the core idea is that the Scrum Master does exactly that. 
because it's one of the goals of Agile and therefore the Scrum Master has to help us to get more Agile, understand the process and, and all of that. So even like, um, yeah, hearing about impediments and therefore ensuring they're out of our way and we can do our work as a team. However, if this is something we are getting used to, we as the rest of the team, except for the Scrum Master, this means we rely completely on the Scrum Master and we never take the responsibility to do this ourselves. And therefore, we will never manage to self-organize. It's always like, okay, I don't have to think about this because there will be somebody who will do the thinking for me. He, there's the Scrum Master reminding me like, oh, did you do this and that? And remember, we have agreed on that, and I will check if all the whatever unit tests are there and whatever it is, which ensures I stop thinking about that, right? So my absolute advice here is to regard the Scrum Master not really as a position or a role of a single person, but as a responsibility that should be taken by everyone in the team. And there are different ways how you can get there. And I'm not saying to do that on day one when you start using Agile. On day one, you have probably different problems. But if you really want to become a self-organizing team, you have to work on, and I really mean that, you have to work on or work towards getting rid of the Scrum Master. That might sound strange, but this makes you a self-organizing team. Maybe you never achieve that, and that's fine as long as you are aiming for it. And aiming for it, it could mean just like, okay, we have these different meetings, and we take turns in organizing them and being responsible for whatever, leading a retrospective or so. And um, it can mean um, like uh, we take turns in general who is in that, who, who, taking turns in general and taking the responsibility for everything a Scrum Master does and by in this way creating the awareness of okay what do we have to think about in that role and maybe then I think also about this when I'm not in that role right so getting just moving a step ahead and it might be inconvenient at first but it, it helps you to make that step becoming a more self-organizing team A uh, different topic now. Uh, the different topic is on uh, multitasking, which is really a, a big thing, I believe. So the, the first absolute recommendation, or maybe it's a requirement, every individual should work exactly on one team only. And um, maybe this is obvious for a lot of actual people, but for people who are starting with Agile and for people not being Agile, this is often the biggest challenge. Because most of the companies, they think that, well, there are people who have some slack time maybe and therefore they should work with that other team as well or they are so special in their expertise that we have to use that expertise in this team and that team and that team and this team. And therefore, there's no way for that single person to work on a single team, which also means those teams don't have the competency, and remember, responsibility and tasks, in the one hand. But they're like visitors going back and forth. And most often, if you are set up like this, I would assume there are no teams, really. There are only individuals jumping back and forth uh, around projects. And um, so the, the problem with this is, well, as soon as people have to switch between different teams, meaning also different projects and tasks, the, the thing is happening that there's always somebody I can only say it this way, shouting at one, if it would be you, oh, what I need to do is way more important than what you are working at right now, right? So 
Can you just leave that for a moment and work on my project now? This is really, really, really so important. And if you don't do that, maybe I get a little bit louder and then even louder and then I'm jumping up and down in front of your desk or so. Hmm. So this is often what, what's happening and this means that now still sticking with you, you have to leave what you were thinking about and working on right now, start something new, which is a task switch, and these task switches, according to research, takes at least 30% of the productivity away. And I always wonder, do, are we so productive in those organizations that we can afford this? To waste all that time? And the, I, I understand the idea. The idea is that, well, this is, has a higher priority than the other thing, and maybe we forgot about that at first or whatever, so um, this is why somebody has to work on that now, but we are losing way more than that we are gaining, and this is a, a big, big problem. Um, and therefore, the the requirement is, again, everyone works exactly for one team and can stay focused during an iteration. And the iteration, well, maybe, and I had that too, we were not able to keep the priorities at the same level for a long time. So we had to shorten the iterations. But um, so, like, the... Uh, which I, I went to one of the talks today where they said they have three week iterations. So that w maybe it's not possible because things are changing too fast. Maybe you need two weeks, maybe you need one week iterations. But ensure that people can stay focused during that time and are not like the, the example I made with you, like I'm dragging you out and you have to work on something else. So keeping the focus is what makes teams productive. And I want to um, make something else hopefully a bit clearer, what, what I mean with the multitasking, which is, I believe, also very bad for the business. And bad for the business, that's really weird. I would like to stand there, but I, I'm afraid. <laughs> OK, we, I have a, a very, very simple example. And it's oversimplified. I'm sorry about that. Imagine we have three projects. This is project one, two, and three, right? And they all take, we make this really easy, they all take three months. So if we work on all of them at the same time, so the multitasking and multi-projecting and all of that, that would mean, again, I know I'm oversimplifying here, that would mean all three of them would be done after three months, right? So this is when we, when we are done, this is the way we were working on it. So it's one, two, and then the three months are, are over. However, if we would work on one project after the other, this would mean we get a first return on investment after one month, because this one project is done. And another return on investment after two months because now the second project is done and so on. So it's even if you look at it from a business point of view, it makes more sense to really prioritize even in your portfolio and not starting to work on several projects at the same time but rather finish one after the other because you're making money if you do and you're losing money if you don't. And again, I know things are often more complicated, but the, the problem really with this way of working is, to me, it's nobody takes the decision, really, what's really important. And so that lack of decision is left to the poor developer, and again, again point to you, because everyone comes to your desk and say, I really need this, and the next one says, I, I really need that, and, and so on. And, um, 
it's really up to you to decide what would you work on. And I'm not sure if, if you are then in that position the right person. Maybe somewhere else should, we should make that decision which will make the money for us, really. OK, going to team maturity stages and collaboration. So first of all, this is a very old model. And I'm pretty sure that a lot of you have seen that. That's Tuckman's model. And um, I'm even not sure. Is it 67 or something where, where this was created? It's really an old one. It's about a team getting together, needing some time to, until it get, really gets productive. And the, the different stages, I really don't want to go into detail with that. But, but still, just to, as a reminder, maybe, the different stages are the forming. The team is getting together. So it's not a team at this point in time. And then a storming is happening, where we come up with the, how do we actually collaborate here. Then um, the norming, we all accept and agree on, on our way of working. And then finally, the performing, we are productive. And then the trolling, the team gets apart for, again. So I, t I only want to have you to keep this in mind, because that's another thing that I see too often, that teams are assembled and disassembled way too often. And companies forget that this is also a big productivity mm -hmm. loss by putting teams together every once in a while and not using a productive team for just another thing we work on, like another product, another project, and so on. So it's kind of going through all these stages again and again. And uh, that's kind of my, my main point here. The other point is that in order to go through these different stages, there are also th things that can help us to get more productive. And the one thing I want to start with is also something you can use, even if you're a productive team and you're starting working on a new project, which is the actual chartering, which I believe is often forgotten or ignored. So we know we need a joint goal and, and stuff like that. But maybe we need more than that. Maybe we need exactly our rules and how we work together, the development with the business, the development team within itself, and, and all that. So we need to agree on our way of working. and. The, the uh, book where you can look up and know more about that. That's the lift up of book for, by Diana Larson and Anthony Nees. And what I find really important is what, what I have hopefully highlighted. Yeah, I think you see that here too, is that that HL charter, that's kind of the result or, um, well, maybe it is the starting point for your journey when you are working together because it's really more an activity. The chartering itself is the thing that brings you together, and not so much the document that's created there. And uh, I just want to ensure you go back to that and maybe keep this in mind, that there's more to it than just, OK, now let's get started with this project. Another thing that helps us to get more productive, surprise, surprise, our retrospectives. At least I would hope so. That's what they are for. And um, one thing that we want to have there in the retrospective is that really everyone is hurt because everyone has an idea how we can get more productive and how we can learn from one, one from each other and um, what are the practices that are helping us and what maybe do we need to do differently in the next iteration and all of that. And actually, now that I just went to um, Ed's talk before this one, this reminded me of, of something that I forgot, which is not on the slide. So a colleague of mine who wrote a, a book on retrospectives last year, published it last year, he added something to retrospectives which I find is really important. So he says, so whenever you do your action planning, come up with a hypothesis and say, with this hypothesis, what kind of change do you expect from this action? Because it's not only about implementing those actions, it's also about do they 
um, result in that change you hope for, or maybe those actions result in something completely different, which you don't want, but you still kind of succeeded because you implemented that action, but this is not good enough. So adding a hypothesis to why you want to do something, what you want to achieve with it, is really helpful here as well. So, and retrospectives help you also in a different way for, again, we are talking about teams here, because it shows what are our joint values, what is our joint history, what we can build up on, that brings a team together as well. And um, one more word before I go to what I have here on the top, the team decisions, um, Another thing that I find important too, it's not only the group learning, it's also personal, personal development that's important. And for personal development, several things are, I believe, really important. One thing is, as an individual, and therefore as well as a group, and hopefully as an organization, to take any kind of mistakes, not as an error, but as a learning possibility, learning opportunity. And the best, of course, is if you have as many role models as possible showing that. So my, my favorite is or would be if really from the top of the organization, people say like, this is the mistake we made and this is what we learned from it. So then this is also easy to deal with mistakes if we would only say, well, this was the mistake we made and okay, now we are doomed, then that's as bad, but we really want to learn from it too. Um, and, and another thing that I find important for personal development, which we sometimes forget, is that also leading is something that's happening by the individual. And Steve said something along these lines also in the morning at, at, in his keynote address. The, the point is, well, we sometimes think the manager, the scrum master, the product owner, the whoever is the one being in the lead. But actually, at many points in time, these are completely different people who are in the lead. And it, it's really leadership is in the hands of everyone who is working on something. And the leadership might be really in, in, a, in different ways, like uh, leadership according to the architecture we are building or the leadership in terms of what, what kind of tests we are creating or how we deal with the tests and, and all that. So the, the important thing is to be aware that we are all leaders. There isn't anything like only this class of people are leaders. Everyone is a leader here. And I believe this is it for now. And I want to go into team decisions. And first of all, I want to ask you, which, what kinds of decisions have you experienced? So who is making a decision? Any idea? Just in a general way. Yeah. Okay, so we have already at least uh, one thing what I'm hearing, what we deliver is decided by the product owner. This sounds, and it could, it could work this way, but it doesn't have to work this way. This sounds like an autocratic decision. It's kind of a boss decision, right? It's like a, a person. It doesn't have to be that way, but it could be. So this is the, what I want to look at. That, that's fine. That's, that's all fine. I'm not questioning. I just want to go on a kind of a meta level. How do we make decisions? So it's, I'm not like touching or anything. So um, the one now I'm trying this, somebody catching me there. <laughs> so the, the one decision is an autocratic decision. So it's a typical, like a often a top-down, it's a boss, something, saying like, okay, this is the way we go, this is the way we do it, and everyone just follows that. Any thoughts about that? How does this feel, or what's helping there, what's hindering? Well, 
Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Responsibility is with one person. Um, very often this is very clear. It's obvious who makes that decision. It's not like uh, we are questioning it or talking a lot about that or something like that. Often it's also quicker than any other kinds of decisions. And may maybe I leave it at that for now. Oh, you have something, sorry. Um, okay. Uh -huh. So the question is if it's always automatic and autocratic decision if the decision is made by a single person. And at the moment I would say yes. Maybe if I sleep over it or think about it several hours I come up with a different answer. But at the moment I would think yes it's always autocratic because it's a, a single person there. And if you think about now staying with this, like on, the, on this top level, what, what other kinds of decisions do you know? Consensus. Consensus? Do you want to say something about consensus? Where everybody, everybody agrees. Exactly. Takes a long time. Oh, yes. Okay, so this is another way of making a decision, right? We are talking it through and over and everyone is getting hurt, definitely. And we want to hear if everyone really is in it and has a buy-in what we are doing here and goes forward with that. That's the cool thing. Uh -huh. So there's this comment that not necessarily everyone is happy with the consensus decision. Maybe it's the, the uh, smallest uh, denominator, right? So it's kind of the thing we can agree on. That could be the thing. Sometimes it even goes uh, in that direction that, well, in order to be social, I just agree. So something like that. But still, I, I, can, well, this can work, this can work. Anything else? Another idea? Wait. Maturity. Oh, sorry. Um, it's. Yeah, right. That's democratic. Anything about that? Any ideas, comments? Mm-hmm. Make stands. Or oh, take stands is actually probably more. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. The big problem with majority democratic decision is what's happening with the minority? Yeah. The the point is minority is ignored. So they, they don't have any say really. So if I think about democratic elections, the votes that are counted later on, it's only the one from those, right? So, and that could mean that if you make a, a decision by, it's not me, <laughs> if you make a decision, a majority decision, that you have a group of people who will work against that decision because they feel ignored, right? And then we have another one. Any ideas? Are they enforced? Enforced can be like an autocratic, actually. Convinced? Can probably maybe happen everywhere. So the thing, and this is now, I should have put this the other way around because now it's further down here, which is called 
a decision on, uh, this is the phone, uh -huh. based on consent, not consensus, but on consent, and it's called sociocratic. And with consent, if you compare it to consensus, consensus asks, does everyone agree, or everybody agrees here? We are not, I don't know. There are so many bags here. Just answer it. So with consensus, we say everybody agrees, whereas with Consent, the question is, does anyone object? Which is a different question, yeah? That's okay. The point here is with consent is nobody objects. And in that way of deciding with nobody objects is, well, we are asking for any objections, and not only any objections, but also any paramount recent objections. And as soon as they are stated, well, first of all, we are inviting those. It's not like it's um, being unsocial, which is often filled here. We're inviting the, those because we believe this will make whatever we decide upon better. It will improve our decision. And which means also, if it's really done in the consent sociocratic way, it means whoever states this objection doesn't own the objection, so we are not starting to convince that person. Instead, as soon as it's stated, the objection is owned by the whole group, and it's like, oh, probably we forgot something, we overlooked something, and we have to make a change to the proposal in order to deal with this. And with this asking for objection, it's also kind of now going, well, we are talking about deep decisions here, it's also about what's our say, team tolerance level, if you want to say, can I tolerate, can I live with that decision? Or does it hurt my values, my personal wants, and therefore maybe also like the team wants? So it's a way of working in a, yeah, working with decisions in a different way. And probably we could talk about sociocracy and, and consent in a way longer, a way longer time. However, my, my important, or I hope my important thing is I want to point you there. So look for consent or sociocratic or sociocracy and learn about different ways of making decisions. So it's not those decisions only that we can make. There are also different possibilities to come up with a decision. And I hope this is one thing that you can take home. How much time do we have? Okay, I want to switch the topic completely. Uh, well, completely not. We are still talking about teams and so on. <laughs> I want to switch to the topic of large and global self-organizing teams. And first of all, it's maybe... Uh, come on. Okay, I think maybe this is the reason. Um, first of all, I want to maybe repeat a little bit of what we, how we started. So remember like the competency, the responsibility, the task, it all in one hand. This is also true if you work with several teams and also if those teams are global. And very often I see just the opposite. I see like we have, um, let's say like analysis or architecture in, in, in one country and uh, testing in another country and uh, uh, the UI experts are again somewhere else, and the business is also developed in a fifth country or so. I'm, I'm not sure if I did the counting right. And the problem with that, again, there is not a single team which can take the whole responsibility for a delivery. It's always waiting for somebody. 
it's kind of being dependent on one to each other. So what we need to have are teams that are, again, enable to work in a self-responsible way and not relying on whatever else, whoever else is around there and helping them. And um, let's take a look how this, how this can be. There are often um, two ways, at least. Well, what do I want? I think I need, want my blue one again. <laughs> So here's a team, and there is a team, and we have another team. And now we can even think of like maybe there is an ocean in between. My black ocean here, whatever. So they are sitting in different continents, different sites, whatever. Um, so the first idea often people have when they think about working in a global way is more or less this picture. It's what's called distributed teams. So it's several teams, each of the several teams working together on the same thing, having the same goal, so the bigger goal. And each of those teams is co-located. That's often the, the picture people have. So it's called distributed teams because it's distributed over several continents or sites, several sites. However, each team is co-located. The problem with this is, well, sometimes the problem is maybe at that site, oh, I don't have all the required roles, know-how, whatever I need to really get stuff into according to the definition of done, right? So that could be one, positive, one problem. Another problem that I see with this is it's very, very likely that sooner or later they do things this way, they do it that way, and they do it another way. So we are starting to, well, using different kinds of patterns, for example, or um, speaking of, uh, for example, conceptual integrity will fall apart completely because everyone is just concentrating on this is how we do things around here. So um, there is another possibility to create teams, which is, and now I didn't leave enough space. Um, And that's another way of creating a team. And this kind of team would be called a dispersed team. So it's a team that's distributed in itself, which is different than distributed teams, which are still co-located, right? Very often in the projects I'm working on, we have both kinds of things. So just to, to say that. However, the dispersed teams, at first glance, you might think, oh, this is a stupid idea. We all learned that teams have to sit in one room and being close together and blah, blah, blah. But you also heard about that other thing. Maybe it's not possible to really create those cross-functional teams because we don't have the people there. And also the conceptual integrity kind of thing might be a big problem too. So and that's why dispersed teams are often not the worst decision. So these are the, the different, actually the kind of simple dispersed team you might have is people working from their home office. That's also a dispersed team, though there, there doesn't have to be like an ocean in between. So that's um, my kind of a, a basic assumption here about uh, working on a global level. Now I want to dive a little bit deeper into conceptual integrity and the pro problem maybe with that. Yeah, maybe it is a problem. The thing um, you might remember from whatever scrum school and so on is that we are talking always about, well, I use that term now, like, about feature teams. Teams that are focusing on creating a business value. 
So that's the important thing. We want to create the business value in order to make the customer happy. Now, if you think about, well, we have here three, no, four teams. I can't even count. We have here four teams, and even if you, maybe you have 10 teams or even more, if each of those teams is focusing on creating business value, you might have a problem because nobody will watch the architecture, really. And again, things like conceptual integrity might fall completely apart, and we are creating features after features, but everything that's more technical related might disappear or might be forgotten. And whenever I get asked that question, so you turn in that setting, that's fine. We're focusing on, on business value. Where's the architecture here? I can only give this typical consultant answer, and you all have heard that. It depends. Right? And I start looking into what does it really depend on? And I want to show you what I believe it depends on. At least this is how we implement that in, in several projects. So the dependency on how you support the architecture over several teams is the complexity of the stuff you're building. And the complexity, again, is something that's maybe a little bit weak. Um, so I try to, where do I start? Maybe like this and like that. The complexity can be looked at in two dimensions, and probably there are more, but the thing that's important for the architecture, I believe, is the rate and amount of changes. And there might be few, and there might be, let's say, massive. And on the other hand, the uncertainty that could be high or low. And the uncertainty regards like the technology we are using or also the business we are implementing. Maybe it's the first time we are doing something like this and therefore we are not sure and uh, we, we learn from our customer every day something new and that's why we are really very uncertain of what we are doing here. And if, if we are looking in at complexity and at the system this way, we find out that we have, oops, we have here few changes, we are very certain, we are talking about a stable system. We know pretty what, much what we are doing and probably this system is around for a long time. So there is a change every once in a while, but well, it's also uncomplex here. And on the other hand, now that I say that, here we have a very complex system. Things are changing all the time. We don't really know where we are heading. We don't know the technology. We have problems understanding the business, whatever it is. So things are fluent, changing all the time. And then maybe this is a bit too way down there, but well. And this in between is adapting. So it's all like mediocre changes, uncertainty, kind of we can't deal with it, but we have to do something about that. And now the, the question again was, how do we deal with architecture if we are focusing on business value only and we have those business feature teams? Remember, that was how we started. Um, so let's start here. If we are in a stable world, a typical answer for that is um, one that could be we have something like a chief architect. It's pretty stable, it's not a lot to look after, but every once in a while we need to have a decision and we need to ensure everyone understands the architecture, so there's somebody ensuring that. So that is one idea or one thing that we are implementing. Another thing that we are implementing, and typically it's either or, either we have a chief architect or we have like in every team, like one person, 
taking responsibility for architectural decisions, and that's typically what's better known as community of practice. So those people who are having those wearing that hat for the architecture, they are coming together ever once in a while when it's needed. So when we have to make a decision here for our stable system, when we have to make a change in the architecture, then this community of practice is coming together. So in a stable world, we have here <coughs> a chief architect or a community of practice, COP. If we are on the other extreme, so if we are in a really highly complex area, things are changing all the time, remember, then what we need is a separate team dealing with this. So we have another team which I call a technical service team who deals with everything around conceptual integrity, architecture, whatever is the thing that's making our world so complex. That can be, for one uh, system, it could be everything around UI. For another system, it could be everything around databases. For another system, whatever it is that makes our system so complex and where we have all those uh, difficulties, uncertainties, changes. And this technical service team, oh, this is what the, the bad thing is, is that I put it on top. It shouldn't be on top. It's not what I mean with this. I call it also a technical service team because it provides a service to all the other teams. So you can also look at this, well, if it provides a service, it has a customer. Oh, maybe it has many customers. The many customers are all these other teams, which also means all these other teams are filling the backlog for the technical service team and deciding on priorities. So it's not in a way as you might know it from maybe the old, maybe still the days at the moment, like a team of architectures sitting uh, at, on the ivory tower and making whatever kind of decisions nobody finds useful. They are driven by their customers, by the business teams, feature teams. And this was called the technical service team. <coughs> and then the last one, if you are in adaptive area, so kind of mediocre changes every once in a while, but not as few as here, and uncertainty kind of in between as well, then we also have the support needed, which is in between those two, which are typically more like a technical consultants that we have here. So it's more like people like those people here, but they are not working as a team. They are more whenever one of them needs the support because they are entering an area where they are very uncertain, where a lot of changes are happening. Then one or two of them become members of that team for the period of the time they are dealing with that. So, and then there are regular members helping them. So it's not like any kind of PowerPoint or something. They're really working with those teams. And um, so that's what I, the consultancy aspect is, just that they're supporting for a specific amount of time. And this is here. And now I said specific amount of time, which most often means, and now making this picture even less readable, <laughs> maybe, is that a typical time frame is this. If we are starting on a new product, maybe we are very uncertain. We don't really know what's going on here. Maybe we really need a lot of support from the technical side and therefore we start with a separate team focusing on that, ensuring 
that everyone else can focus on the business value and that we can use that for all the other teams. And after a while, things are getting more and more stable, so we are more in the adaptive area. So these, these uh, most often it's the same people, the technical uh, service team people, we don't need all of them anymore. Maybe we only need three of them anymore, or five, or whatever. And they provide consultancy service whenever a team needs that. And then if we are even getting more stable, then they become just regular team members and are part of every normal, regular feature team. So this is kind of now, speaking of large teams and how we can support both the business value plus conceptual integrity. And most often we forget the one or the other. So if we work like kind of in a non-agile way, it's the focus on the components, it's more on the technical aspect and not focusing on delivering the business value. And if we are looking at the business value only and having like this feature teams only, then the architecture is the, the often the kind of the problem because we ignore it too much. So this is I think all I wanted to offer. So we still have a little bit of time and I oh, here it is. I just want to check if this is true. Yeah. So maybe this as a summary. So what we want to have is cross-functional teams can, uh, being able and able to self-organize. So all the roles, competency, responsibility within that single team. Um, and then we uh, want to have the feature teams. Oh, we didn't talk a lot about the product owner. Not at all, actually, but maybe it's um, because it's not any different than what you have kind of learned. So if we are in the large, it must be obvious that every team has somebody saying what's the most important thing to work on, just as you mentioned before with the autocratic decisions, right? And um, then we talk about the distributed and dispersed feature teams. And at the, the end right now, it was kind of the conceptual integrity that technical service teams might help us to ensure the business value. And then there was this other thing, and maybe I show you that again, the different ways of making decisions. And maybe you want to think of looking at another way of making decisions based on constant and sociocratic. Oh, and I want to come back to your question about, like, is the autocratic always, uh, no, is a one person decision always an autocratic decision? And I still would answer this with yes. However, if you make a, a constant sociocratic decision, like, for this thing we want to decide upon, we trust you that you make the right decision. It's kind of a mix, and this is what sociocracy is as well about. So it doesn't mean we always decide on consent. It could mean we decide, depending on what we want to decide upon, this is now more consensus, maybe it's a maturity, maybe it's an autocratic, whatever we think is meaningful. So then maybe my, my answer would be more like yes, and it's still also that, right? Okay, we have a few more minutes for questions. Yeah? There's a microphone coming. The microphone is not on. No? Yes. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Yeah. So I'd like to get back to um, the responsibility of Scrum Master. Um, you said that uh, it might prevent uh, the teams to be uh, more self-organized. And uh, sometimes maybe team members can pick up this uh, responsibility. Um, I was wondering uh, how much distraction can it cause? How much uh, context switching uh, uh, can it cause for that particular team member if there is no dedicated uh, Scrum Master? Mm -hmm. So, uh, 
I want to repeat, first of all, I wouldn't suggest this from day one, right? So if we are starting with Scrum, then it's probably not a good idea to start to take turns in the role of the Scrum Master because we are busy learning all kinds of things. So and, and we really, I, I really believe we will need the help and the support of somebody who is passionate about what the Scrum is doing for us, and that's typically the Scrum Master. So you take turns once people understood what Scrum is about, and once they understood it, and once they start taking turns, the effort putting into the role of the Scrum Master should get lower and lower because everyone understands what self-organization means. And it's not about relying on that person cleaning up after we made a mess, putting it this way. So um, how much does it distract as a start of taking turns? I always uh, calculate with like 30% of our time, so of that person person's time, so that the availability putting into the iteration would be 30% less than normally he would put into. So I, I even have this kind of number. And again, after a while, it should go further down even. However, I never, never ever so far have seen a team really saying, OK, we don't need that role at all because we are completely self-organizing here. I haven't seen that. But maybe we get there. And I see Mike is coming. Maybe one more question. I don't know how long. One more question, yeah. My question is, um, what can help teams to get from a very command and control situation today to really start on that road? You said that it's like doing daily stand-ups is not enough, and I agree. But what are some of the things that we can do? And also, um, just from the position that I'm a scrum master, and there's like a whole management structure above me that is obviously still requesting things in the old way because that's what we are all used to. Yeah. So how can we help to move to a more self-organized team? And also taking into consideration that my colleagues are not used to being self-organized, yeah. but they are used to being told what to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it actually, especially the last thing, but also the, the rest of your question, it takes time. So being patient is probably one of the things. And it probably also needs a really long answer, but I try to make a, a short one here. So a very short one is often we think of, OK, um, this organization needs to change, or our organization needs to change, and it doesn't change. So what's going on here? An organization will never change by itself. It only changes by every individual who works for that organization. So it's really also a very much a self-responsible thing. And it's kind of, maybe you can even think of a virus. So somebody is starting being very passionate and infecting the next one, the next one, the next one. And I, I believe especially, well, no, I just wanted to say especially bottom up, but it's not true. It's also true for top down. This is the only way you can make a change in an organization, by one, peop one person after the other. And um, in, in general, for, for this kind of specific question, and that's the answer already, I would start asking questions. So what does it help you for? Why do you need this? What do you do with this? So all, all the things you feel like they are requesting from their old hierarchy model. So just. And, and it doesn't mean, and you have to be very clear about that, it's not necessarily that you're with this, in this way, asking you judge it and say this is bad, but just making people think about why they are believing they need this and that. And again, the first answer is it, it will take time. It's a, a culture change, and I once learned a culture change takes about 10 years. So we can't expect that after three months, everything will be different. OK, thank you very much. <laughs>